Hopefully you will find uh, the presentation interesting. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about iron chromatography uh, and mass spectrometry. So uh, I've been a big fan of iron chromatography for a long time. In fact, it was the first uh, system, uh, chromatography system that I ever built was uh, iron chromatography in about 1982 or something like that. So I've been doing iron chromatography for longer than I really care to remember. But now we have an opportunity to um, really uh, use some really nice, uh, sophisticated systems uh, in combination with uh, mass spectrometry. So uh, this is it. The presentation overview, um, what I'll do is I just want to um, take a look at the, the CUPE method. And I know that there are some negative uh, and positive aspects uh, to this method. So just uh, explain those just uh, very briefly. Uh, to give you an update on the current status of iron chromatography with uh, mass spectrometry for the determination of these uh, compounds. Uh, discuss some recent developments and the results from a collaboration uh, which we have done with the Ferroscience Limited uh, in the UK. And uh, many of you know that I used to work uh, for Ferro and I actually set up the iron chromatography uh, system in Ferro about seven or eight years ago, specifically <coughs> to analyse glyphosate. So this is, for me, it's just a continuation of um, an ongoing story. And then I'll give you a, a, a very brief summary and just a couple of slides to just show you what some of the future possibilities are in uh, using iron chromatography. And before I start the main presentation, then I would really like to acknowledge some co-authors, um, Dr Stuart Adams and Jonathan Guest, who were my ex-colleagues at Ferris Science Limited in the UK. And Jonathan Beck and Frank Schauchen, who are my colleagues in Thermo Fisher Scientific, who have been involved in the collaboration. So as uh, everyone is aware, that polar ionic pesticides uh, are in the news. Uh, I guess that they've been in the news for quite some time and never really gone away. And that's because they're widely used in agriculture and also because these uh, residues of these compounds um, appear, um, occur because of uh, food preparation uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in food uh, facilities. And what that means is that we get a high frequency of, of residues of uh, some of these compounds um, detected in food. For example, in the European Pesticide Residues Workshop 2014, there were quite a number of posters on residues of chlorate uh, in leafy vegetables and also perchlorate, uh, not related, but residues uh, from uh, fertilisers because perchlorate is in quite high natural concentrations in uh, some of the fertilisers which we use. More recently, in 2016, then it's uh, the Alliance for Natural Health in the US of A reported um, residues of glyphosate in breakfast cereals. Well, it's not really a surprise since... Uh, Glyphosate is widely used to desiccate crops. So if we actually spray the, the glyphosate on the crops uh, near to harvest, then it's not surprising that we will get residues in cereals and cereal products. But in 2016, maybe uh, more concerned to some people, that there was glyphosate detected in uh, German beers. And I don't think it's exclusively in German beers. It's also in other, other beers uh, uh, as well. And of course, the glyphosate story, um, glyphosate became under greater scrutiny after the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which informs the uh, World Health Organization on cancer risk factors, classified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen in March 2015. Now, there was a discussion on this uh, topic yesterday, and I'm not, I don't know whether this is, uh, it is or it isn't, but the fact is that it's in the news and therefore we have to respond from an analytical perspective in the terms of monitoring samples. And if you want more information on this, then you can look up, you can uh, read my blog on the analysis of the pesky polar pesticides, uh, which is on the uh, Thermo website on analyteguru.com. So there's a little bit more information on the background. So going back to the, the CUPE uh, method, so this is the uh, CUPE method for um, samples of plant origin, then we know that it's a very generic extraction using acidified uh, methanol. There's no partition, <laughs> there's no cleanup. Um, and 
The, the method was developed by the EURL for single residue methods in um, Stuttgart. And we know it's not a perfect method, but then I think it depends on your view. So either we say in the UK that the glass is half empty or it's uh, half full. So if you look at it from uh, the half empty negative uh, point of view, then you might complain that the extracts contain high amounts of co-extractives, uh, which contaminate the columns and the, the MS uh, system. Uh, you see very often observed variation in the retention times of glyphosate, especially when using the hypercarb column, uh, which makes life uh, difficult. Um, there are variable recoveries in precision, but we can use uh, labelled internal standards, but then it becomes uh, more costly. And the other factor is that even though you've got a single generic extraction, then you very often have to use a combination of different column chemistries to be able to monitor all of the pesticides. So that's kind of negative points of view. But I would prefer to take the, uh, the half full like, positive uh, view because um, I think uh, that because of the nature of these kind of uh, compounds, that the compromises are almost inevitable. I mean, it's just uh, a fact of life, I guess. Um, and I think that the having a generic method, and even though it's not perfect, it's still more cost-effective compared to uh, previous appro approaches, which needed uh, like derivatization. So I can remember there was a single method for fosatile aluminium, for example, which was a derivatization method. One for glyphosate. There's were two for glyphosate, FMOC, and uh, the alpha Ness method. So those methods were expensive to implement. And I think that on a very positive note, then, at least using the CUPE method that has enabled the analyses of the pesticides uh, that were previously monitored hardly ever to at least be monitored and to generate data. So I think that's a very positive uh, fact. And also, because of the efforts of the EURL laboratory, then labelled internal standards uh, for these uh, compounds have become more commercially available. So at least they are available if we want to, to, to use them. So I think there's many positive things that have, have come from uh, the work that has been done by the, uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, single residue uh, uh, method laboratory. And then if we look at the method, I think uh, that, that the, the latest version is 9.1. I know it keeps changing, it's constantly being updated, but I think the latest one, at least a few days ago, it was, uh, was 9.1. And the method lists a total of around 42 um, different analytes which need to be analysed either in, in the positive and the negative mode. And in the, in the negative mode, this is the, the, the list of compounds. So these are ones which people are really very familiar with. So, uh, for example, ethophon and its metabolite, glufosinate and metabolites and glyphosate, phosphonic acid, um, phosotile, malic hydroxide, um, perchlorate, chlorate, etc. So I think people are quite familiar with uh, analysing uh, these compounds, even if they have to use um, different methods. And then if we look at the, um, the compounds in the positive mode, then I suspect that these compounds are monitored uh, maybe a little bit less uh, frequently, with perhaps the exception of uh, uh, glyphosate in uh, mepicort, which we've... Um, uh, sorry, um, Chloramacort and Mepicort, which we've analysed uh, like quite, for quite a number of years now. Um, also on this list is Dicort, Paracort, but because of the nature of those compounds and the need for using a very strong acid extraction to get good extraction efficiency, then that really is a separate method. That's an extraction, um, a, a, a separate extraction method and a, a, completely, uh, a, a completely different method. And also you can see the compound which is in yellow at the bottom is one which has been added uh, recently. So as I said, this is uh, being continuously updated. So this is what we're faced with, is trying to do this large number of, uh, of difficult compounds, polar compounds, which are difficult to extract and difficult to um, chromatograph using sort of conventional chromatography techniques. So I mentioned previously that we started this work, it was in uh, 2007, when we were asked to analyse glyphosate and glufosinate in sweeteners which were used in the food industry and the target concentration was one uh, ppb at that time so that was in 2007 and the only way we could achieve this was by using um, a dianex system 
It was an ICS 3000 system, and at that time it was coupled to um, an AB Sykes API 2000 MS system. And people will know that the sensitivity of that system compared to systems today is, was, was pretty low. I mean, the, it's improved probably a hundredfold since then. So the only way we could do it was to inject large volumes. So we actually injected, in some cases, 4.7 mils, 4,700 microliters of sample in order to get to these um, levels. But we did it, and it, was, it proved to be robust. Um, we used it for several years. We analysed thousands of samples. Um, the glufosinate was a little bit more difficult because the response is about five times less, but we did achieve it. The problem was, of using such a large volume injection, is the fact that you obviously um, get to lower limits of quantification, but you contaminate your system more quickly. You contaminate the columns, and we have to clean them offline, which we did. In fact, we had two sets of columns. We had one set which we ran uh, for a batch of analysis, and then we took them offline, we cleaned them, and then we switched the columns between, between batches. So we cleaned the columns very frequently, and the columns uh, were in place for maybe a year or maybe two years, analysing thousands and thousands of samples. So the columns proved to be very robust. In this system, which I'll explain later, we have a suppressor, and uh, we used to contaminate the suppressor as well. And, and when that happened, then what you saw was um, glufosinate was an indicator compound, so you would lose um, the peak shape for glufosinate. And this is an example of glufosinate at 5 ppb and the peak shape after 4,000 uh, injections. And then when we replaced the suppressor, then on the, the right-hand side, you can see that we got the peak shape back. And in terms of the mass spec, you can see the contamination after uh, 100 uh, in, in injections. So it was, we managed to do it, but it took um, a lot of maintenance. But now today, in 2016, uh, we have more sensitive uh, mass spectrometers. And this is the, um, the Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, Quantiva uh, mass spectrometer. And this is the one that we use in collaboration um, with, uh, with Ferris Science Limited. Um, and they've evaluated th this in combination with the uh, ion chromatography system, which again is a newer model. It's a 5,000 um, system. Um, and one of the advantages of using the thermo ion chromatography with the thermo mass spectrometry is it can be properly integrated for system control. And that's quite important, was, and, and you, you will see why later. It doesn't mean to say that you can't connect it to another mass spectrometer, it just means that with this combination that you've got more system control. Uh, and that's via the, um, the Trace Finder uh, software, uh, version 3.2. And our objective was to try and develop multi-residue analysis of these polar ionic pesticides in the cube uh, extracts. So with this system, we're using uh, the new generation of IC columns, which have got four micron particle size. Uh, when I started many years ago, there used to be 19 microns particle size. Now they're down to four, they're much more efficient, so you get better peak shapes and uh, it's uh, an improvement. The mass spectrometer is tuned, um, it's optimised for the, these low mass compounds. It's got higher sensitivity than the, the, the 2000 system, so um, obviously we can now do lower volume injections, which helps with the maintenance. And also with this mass spectrometer, we have the ability to change the ion transfer tube whilst the system is done in the vacuum. So that just uh, minimises the downtime, uh, like when we need to do maintenance on, on, on the system. So this is a feature which the, the lab uh, like really like. So just to explain to you the configuration of, of IC um, MS systems. So at the top, um, we have a, a high pressure non-metallic pump, and then we have this uh, patented element generator. So now with this system we're going to use uh, potassium hydroxide is the, is the element. Okay. So we have this uh, system whereby we have a cartridge which contains salts and uh, all you need to do is you need to add water to the system. You don't need to make up the mobile phase, you add water, that's all you need to do. And the system will create the mobile phase composition automatically. The advantage of this when you're doing carbonate or potassium hydroxide um, elements is that this way gives you like ultimate precision. 
So you get very good reproducibility of the chromatography. The gradient is always the same. Uh, we have, um, this is uh, just, uh, the next one is the, the CRTC is just a cleanup uh, cartridge for the, um, the mobile face, so it's uh, really pure. And then the one thing that's missing here is that on our system we always use a guard column, so the guard column is missing from this uh, illustration. But then we have a separation column, which is uh, an anion exchange column. Okay, so this, we're, if we've got an anion exchange column, we're going to monitor these compounds in the, as negative ions. So these are deprotonated uh, uh, the molecules. But we've got KOH as a mobile phase, and that's not really very compatible with mass spectrometry. So we have to do another trick. We have something which is called an electrolytic eluent suppressor. And what this does, it actually converts the potassium hydroxide to water. Okay, it's an, it's an electrolytic system, and this is done automatically. So th then that means that the water is more compatible with mass spectrometry. But water is also very difficult to um, uh, dissolve. So we add, uh, we have a makeup uh, pump. This is just an auxiliary pump um, with the uh, uh, organic modifier. In this case, it's cetonitrile. And what that does, that helps with the desolvation in the mass spectrometer. And I'll show you some uh, data to show you the advantages um, of doing this. We also uh, have a conductivity detector in line. That's also important as well. And the reason why we still keep conductivity detector is not to detect the analytes, is to just monitor the conductivity. So if there's something happens to the suppressor and we've got um, um, potassium hydroxide breaking through, it will send a signal to the rest of the system and it will close down. So you, it prevents the KOH reaching the mass spec. So that's something that we learned from an experience that we had many years ago. And uh, Dynex introduced this as a, a failure in the, uh, at Ferrer a, a long time ago. So when we're dealing with these very difficult matrices, then I think one of the issues is the column capacity and the robustness of the columns. And these columns, ion exchange columns that we use, are high capacity columns. And that's why we need to use KOH. You can, use, you can get low capacity ion exchange columns and you can use them with um, other mobile phases, but you need the higher capacity to be able to deal with the matrix. And therefore we've got to use um, more um, like higher strength mobile phase in order to elute the uh, analytes uh, from, from the column. And, and, and I mentioned uh, to you about the, the, the cleaning of the columns. Should the columns get contaminated, which they will inevitably, then um, they can, they're so robust that they can be cleaned. And I've got experience of cleaning these columns like many, many times. And uh, you do not lose any um, like resolving, uh, like resolution on the columns. They, they are extremely robust. And the way that we clean them, to give you an idea, is that um, they get, uh, we pass through one molar potassium hydroxide um, overnight at a low flow rate. And then we change to um, sulfuric acid in the C to nitrile. And then that, that, that's normally good enough. In the past, what we did, we filled it with um, high, high, high concentration of acid and we used to cook it in the oven for an hour at 60 to clean it. And the columns would you know, survive. It was a bit aggressive, but it used, used to work. Um, and also, with the post-column suppressor, um, it's absolutely necessary in order to get the, like the benefits from using these high-capacity uh, uh, um, high ion-exchange columns. But you can also clean the suppressors as well, should it get contaminated. But we need to do that very infrequently. So this is, um, I mentioned about adding organic uh, modifier uh, after the, the separation. And the reason is that you can see from this slide that you get an increase in the response as well because of the desulfation in the mass spectrometer. So for these analytes, then we're getting re, um, an increase in response of maybe 300, 400% in the setup which we're using. So we get an increased uh, response to the compounds. The ideal operating uh, back pressure for the suppressor is around about 100, 150 PSI. And I mentioned that we already monitor continuously the conductivity uh, signal. So, looking at what we did in the past when we were using large volume injection to use in a higher sensitivity system, 
Then this chromatogram uh, on, on the left shows you glyphosate at 100 uh, ppb in a cereal extract uh, with uh, uh, 2,500 microliter injection. So you can see that we've got a reasonable signal to noise. With a new system, if we do exactly the same glyphosate at 100 ppb in a CUP extract, we, delight, we dilute it times, uh, times 10, tenfold dilution, and then we do a 100 microliter loop injection, which is equivalent to 10 microliters of the CUP extract direct. And you can see that the signal to noise is, is much improved compared to the old system, even though we're injecting much, much less, 250 times less analyte. Okay, so we wanted to um, do some real samples and, and uh, be able to show you some real data. Now this is, uh, right, it's not the greatest uh, chromatogram, this is a reconstructed iron chromatogram, really just to kind of show you the retention times of the, of, of the different compounds. So phosphatol aluminium, the first diluting compound, there's clopyrrolid, which I'm not sure is actually in the, meth in the acute method. Uh, there's chlorate and glufosinate, AMPA and acetyl glu um, glufosinate. Ethophon and phosphonic acid, um, then there's cyanouric acid, glyphosate, and perchlorate is the latest uh, eluting compound. But we can look at this in more detail by looking at some um, extracted uh, iron chromatograms. So this is glyphosate and AMPA in cube extracts of wheat flour. So this is glyphosate at 10 ppb concentration in, in a cereal extract. Okay, so we've got quite nice signal to noise. And we have uh, three transitions. You could argue that water is obviously not a very uh, um, specific uh, transition. For AMPA, it's a little bit uh, more tricky. Uh, we don't get such good um, sensitivity. Um, and the peak shape is not quite as good. So again, AMPA is a little bit more difficult. And we're actually working on this because we think that one uh, issue with the AMPA is, is the material that we're using for the suppressor for this system. There are different suppressors. We have another suppressor which we, has been developed for the environment market where they specifically want to use um, to analyse glyphosate and AMPA in the like, surface waters. And uh, it gives much better peak shape. So we've got a prototype uh, suppressor which has been uh, made. So it's higher pressure with this material that's used to see whether we can get the better peak shape for the AMPA and to make sure it doesn't affect any of the peak shapes for the other compounds. Um, and then I know from using the, the method for the hypercarb column that you get a variation in the retention time for glyphosate. And here you can see that uh, over a batch of 30 sample injections, then it just declined very slightly um, by 0.13 minutes. So even if, if you put a standard in the middle of this batch, then you can comply with the Sante guidelines in terms of the retention time. Okay, if we also look at um, uh, glufosinate. Glufosinate is a more difficult compound. Uh, it's about five times less response. It looks a bit more actually in, in this example. But gl um, the glufosinate parent is on the left, and then you've got the two, two metabolites um, to the right. And then if we actually look at the, um, the um, recoveries, etc., we've got the 10 ppb concentration, then all, in, all internal standardly corrected um, in this case, and we've got RSDs of 16% uh, for glufosinate at 10, uh, 3-MPPA is 17, and the n glufosinate is uh, 6. So it's kind of within the, the limits of the uh, Sante criteria. If we look at other um, validation results in wheat flour, then uh, again we've got perchlorate uh, with a precision of 6 at 10 ppb, Chlorate is 5, ethophon 11, uh, clopyrrolid as, as didn't really give us sufficient sensitivity at the 10 ppb level. At 50 ppb, then the uh, RSD is uh, 5. Uh, Phosphatile aluminium is spiked at higher concentrations along with phosphonic acid because of the, the MRLs. And um, then the cyanouric acid, which we also tried, didn't give us any uh, sufficient sensitivity at 10. And at 50, we did get uh, like, you know, um, not such good uh, precision. So we need to look at that particular compound. Um, glyphosate in beer. Okay, so this is uh, something which is very topical at the moment, as we said. Um, so there's no need for any extraction for this. We just do a dilution with water, add internal standard, and then just do the analyses. 
So this is um, a sample uh, which we purchased um, containing a residue concentration of 0.58 micrograms per litre. Uh, this is the spike at 0.5 and then you can see a standard addition plot from uh, 0.1 um, to 5 uh, micrograms uh, per litre. And then again, if you looked at the retention time drift with this analysis, so we did 100 continuous injections over two and a half days and the time retention time moved from 14.9 minutes gradually declined over time to 14.6 um, minutes so it's not variable it's just a, a systematic slight decline in the retention time but I think this is much better than the performance that you get with the using the hypercarb column because it's, it's more random in hypercarb we've looked at that ourselves and we've been um, trying experiments in order to um, Modify, not modify the column, but in order to condition the column using different matrices, tea, honey, spinach, and all those things, and looking at injections. And it's very difficult to get the a stable retention time for uh, glyphosate using that, that method. So the results are, I think the results are pretty good. So again, in this case, my beer glass is half full, not half empty. Um, and then there's a lot of interest in chlorate in dairy products, in, uh, in milk products so much so it's very difficult because of the cleaning agents they use in the dairies to get any blank uh, samples so this was actually uh, this is a, a powder sample uh, which is relatively blank so we actually um, reconstitute it to, in order to get the blank and uh, this is uh, at five uh, ppb concentration so you can see um, the three transitions here at five ppb in, in uh, re um, reconstituted milk And then perchlorate in, uh, in dairy products in the same, uh, same sample, again, four, four transitions at five uh, ppb. So we've got reasonably good signal to, signal to noise at five ppb, and we good linearity over the range of uh, uh, five to 100 uh, microgram per kilogram. Another one that you may be interested in is ethophon uh, in, in, in grape. Um, so this is, um, so I don't know why it's 50 microgram per kilogram in grape. This is uh, ethophon here. It's internally standardized in this case at 10 ppb. Then the RSD is, uh, is 70, uh, 17%. Uh, and you, again, you can see the, um, the transition here. There is an a interference in, uh, on, on the second uh, transition. And if you look at other compounds in grape, then it's a very similar story that, you know, with perchlorate and chlorate, um, chlorpyrrolid. In this case, uh, we actually, in the grape matrix, we actually managed to uh, get good data at 10 ppb for chlorpyrrolid uh, with a RSD of uh, 1, with no internal standard um, calibration here. And again, you can see uh, fosatile at higher concentrations has got a, an RSD of 3 and Phosphonic acid is two. Cyanouric acid again is given us poor sensitivity in the great matrix. So that just gives you a kind of an idea of the. Uh, we've got more data, and I'm limited on time, so I can't show you all the data for all the all the different things that we've uh, that we uh, that we ran. Um, at the moment, we're looking at uh, baby foods, and the data is looking uh, equally uh, as good. Um, but now, of course. The, the Orbitrap technology has got very uh, high resolving power at low mass around the mass of uh, these compounds. So we're at, at least 70,000 resolving power for these compounds. So it's quite an interesting to see how the Orbitrap would also perform when it's uh, connected to the, um, the iron chromatograph. And this has actually been done by this laboratory, Veritas Laboratory in Venice, Italy. And they're interested, it's an environment laboratory, they're interested in glyphosate, amper and glufosinate in water. And this is uh, those compounds um, in order in the chromatogram at 20 ppt in surface waters by direct injection, no derivatization. So this is 20 ppt uh, using iron chromatography and uh, the, um, the focus uh, or orbitrap system. So it's pretty impressive. Uh, limits of detection for direct injection. I, do th I think they injected uh, 
one mil, if I remember correctly, but you've, obviously you can do that with water. And in the case of water, you could even, you can do a concentration. You could put a concentration cartridge in the system before the guard column, and then you can get really low limits of detection. We can't do that with acute methods because of the formic acid tends to like, uh, cause a few issues with trying to do the, the concentration. And the formic acid is the reason why we did the dilution, the one in 10 dilution before. They, Ferrer found that they got better peak shapes by diluting and injecting 100 microliters rather than injecting 10 microliters of the cube extract with formic acid. So the systems are robust and very well developed. And last year, uh, Dynex uh, celebrated uh, their 40th anniversary. It's a bit worrying that I actually kind of had a Dynex system about 35 years ago. So I was, I was almost there at the very beginning. But now the latest uh, iron chromatograph is this one, which was launched in, I think it was March 8th, in February. So this one was launched in February. This is the, this is the Integrion system. It's a single channel system. The one that I showed you was a dual channel system. You can have, um, you can run uh, anions in one channel, you can run two columns, you can run cations in the other column. So you've got lots uh, of flexibility. You can have more valves, etc. But the Integrion is a lower cost system uh, and it's a single, single channel system. And the way that we've set up the system at Ferro, we could just now replace the 5,000 system, the more expensive system, with this uh, lower cost uh, module because we're just doing straight chromatography. Uh, we wondered whether we would need to do two-dimensional chromatography. We were thinking of doing IC times IC MSMS. But when we looked at the data, we didn't need to do that because with the higher sensitivity of the Quantiva MS system, it wasn't didn't prove necessary. And we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. OK, so that's what we did with the anions. Now, with the cations, we've not really progressed as far. But we are looking at trying to develop a method for doing the multi-residue analysis of cations in its very early days. So we haven't done analyses of any real samples at the moment. But this is um, the, the compounds which are in the CUPE method. And you can see they've got quite different uh, structures. So it really is a challenge to be able to chromatograph these compounds very effectively. And these are the very first chromatograms which have been generated. Um, so th th these are at relatively high concentrations because this is not mass spec detection. This is detection with conductivity or UV. So we have to bear that in mind. And it might be, when we translate this to mass spectrometry, there may be some problems with the lower concentrations if the compounds bind to the, you know, the system or the matrix or whatever. So we, we're aware of that. But you can see here that we've got the triazole um, metabolites, there's maleic hydrazide. Uh, ETU is a very broad peak. Um, then we've got um, diminazide. Uh, there's uh, casigmycin here. So I don't know how many people are analysing these compounds, casigmycin and um, uh, streptomycin, for example. These are monoglycoside compounds. If you run these on a normal column, there's no retention. They're, they're not retained at all. They just come out in the void volume. So they're nearly always done by doing a derivatization. Not, well, uh, uh, not actually an iron pair, I should say, rather than derivatization. But we know that these compounds are being used. There is evidence that casigmycin is used in the field, and so is streptomycin. But how many laboratories are actually analyzing those compounds in the samples which you analyze? So this is something which we're, 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 um, that we are trying to develop. You can see that we've got paraquat and diquat here co -eluting. And I know that these uh, compounds, as I said before, they need a different method of extraction because you need a more highly acid, uh, um, ex a higher um, acid concentration to be able to extract these effectively, to uh, extract incurred residues. So we did a study, uh, a European study with um, the ERL laboratory where we produced uh, residues with, uh, or ferro produced residues with in, uh, incurred residues just to test uh, that method. But this is just to show that you can get really reasonable peak shapes even though that these compounds are co -elute. And then uh, in the other one here is uh, some of the same compounds but just different conditions. So you can see under these conditions, we've actually managed to move the triazole metabolites with more retention. So we're still developing this method, but it's quite possible 
that we can get all of, uh, many of these compounds into one single multi-residue method, Clormaquat, Mepaquat as well. Okay, but this is the, this is the, uh, you know, the, the very first um, chromatograms. And then I know that laboratories always have a, an issue with like building the business case for a system like, you know, the, do you have enough samples to justify such a system? But you can use it for many things. I mean, some laboratories are uh, like big laboratories doing other things, so bromates, haloacetic acids, metal speciation, anions, organic acids, carbohydrates, amines. So it's got lots of potential uses in, in, in the laboratory. So just to finish off, um, in summary, um, the, the method is uh, validated uh, for the 13 of the polar uh, anionic uh, pesticides, uh, mostly at 10 ppb concentrations. Uh, in a single run, uh, without any real issues of variation in retention time, and that's more, effect, more cost effective uh, compared to analysing a single extract by a number of different chromatographic approaches, which is what laboratories maybe tend to do at the moment. Um, we know that we can make improvements to the system uh, which generated these results, because at the moment the way this system is configured is that we have uh, an iron chromatograph and we have an LC system. And the LC system sits between the mass spec and the iron chromatograph, which means we've got unnecessary dead volume from the iron chromatograph reaching the mass spec. If we reduce that dead volume, we will get better data, uh, which is what happened in the case of the configuration with the, uh, the, the Orbitrap uh, system. Um, we know that we've got, uh, when I was at Ferrer, I've got years of experience of running really dirty extracts and the iron chromatography is proven to be robust for these uh, really dirty samples. Um, I think that there is a real possibility uh, that we will be able to analyse the cations by ICMS. We don't know about the sensitivity at the moment, um, but of course it would extend the scope of the analyses. And then I think coupling the iron chromatograph to an Orbitrap technology uh, in, in, in place of the uh, MS, uh, you know, the uh, triple quarter pole <coughs> technology, that's possible as well. And also the results, at least for glyphosate and those uh, amper glufosinate, they also look very promising as well. And it's easily, quite easy to switch between LC and uh, IC. So if you've got an Orbitrap system or a triple quarter pole system, it's quite easy to connect uh, an IC system to, uh, to those mass spectrometers. Just one, just a quick uh, brief. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, web pages, but there is a food and community page um, where there's lots more information on, uh, on these analytes and also uh, you can get to the product pages where you can find out a lot more information about um, suppressors, uh, element generators, iron chromatography and the column choices which are uh, available. And there's also... Um, an applications library for analytical applications, if you're interested. There's also analyteguru.com, where there's always posts about the, some of the latest, <coughs> the latest things which we're doing. Um, this was on the one that I did on um, the polar pesticides. And then finally, of course, uh, social media is uh, also very important these days. So uh, there's also Twitter and Facebook, YouTube and Pinterest uh, as well. So thank you. <coughs>